my soul, oh my soul, worship this holy name, see like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes So bless the Lord, oh my soul my soul, worship His holy name, see like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great, and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship your holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near. And my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and forevermore So bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. I worship your holy name. All right. Good morning, South Bay Bible Church. It's my honor to be able to come and uh, share with you, even if through a recording. I know it's been quite some time since I've last seen you guys in person. Um, hopefully, as quarantine ends, hopefully sooner rather than later, we can. Uh, see how things return back to normal. Uh, today I have the unique opportunity to speak about a very specific passage uh, that comes from a group of statements that Jesus makes known as the I am statements. Um, and I think as we jump into this, I have a little bit of an introductory statement to make before we actually get into it, which is that I think oftentimes when we read um when we read these passages, I think it becomes easy for us to just kind of take it, read it, nod and agree, and then not really let it do anything in our hearts, in our lives. Um, so I want to really just challenge all of us this morning that as we read 
um, through this passage as we delve into the Word of God together today, uh, that God would really use it to speak into our hearts, speak into our lives, and really just hit us deeper, right? That this wouldn't just be um, maybe some sort of, I already knew that, I don't have to think about that. Um, but really, really, that this can be something that challenges us to grow deeper and deeper in our walk with him. So let me just pray for us to kind of jump into this, that God would just soften our hearts uh, to something that maybe many of us already know, um, to, but to delve a little bit deeper into what God might be trying to say to us this morning. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for really this time to come before you, to read your word, to delve into the riches of your wisdom, God, the things that you share with us about who you are, God. We pray that you would use it, God, to grow us more and more into your likeness, God, to sanctify us. And as we continue on, really, even in the season of Eastertide, um, in the days that come after Easter, we talk about what does it mean to walk with you? God, would you help us? Because we can't do any of this without you. So God, during this time, would you really speak to us, really help us to see and seek for more of you? We thank you and we pray all this in your son Jesus' name. All right. So to start us off, um, as you can see, we are in John chapter 10, verse 7 through 18. Um, and I've got it on the screen. So if you would, just follow along wherever you're at. Uh, read aloud if you feel so inclined. I'm actually going to be focusing a little bit more from just 11 through 18. So if you would follow along with the screen as I read it to you. Okay, so this is John chapter 10, verse 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for them. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I, but I lay it down of my own accord. And I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the word of God. Now, I know... Um, I know a lot of you guys have pets, and for those that don't really know me, for those that I haven't really met or talked with, um, maybe you didn't know, but I, I personally really like dogs. And if I ever could have a dog in the future, I'd really want a Samoyed. Uh, it's a cute fluffy cloud on the screen you see right now. And there's actually even this YouTube channel that I follow um, pretty, pretty often, I would say. Uh, called Mocha Milk, and it's these two dogs, Mocha is actually on the right in this one, and Milk is on the left, kind of as you would guess from their colors. And it's just really amazing to see kind of the bond that their owner has with these dogs, and just how well behaved they are, how much they listen to the owner, how much they they hear their name being called, and they'll just come running from wherever in the house, and. The owner actually had a kid relatively recently and just seeing even the dogs interacting with the baby. Um, it's been really kind of a heartwarming, like heartstring tugging sort of experience for me just to kind of partake in that. Uh, but another thing too, I don't know if you guys have seen some of those videos where um, some man comes back from the military and their dog sees them for the first time in a long time and they'll just start jumping and being so happy and like jumping into their arms of their owner. Now, today we're actually talking about something that I want to say is a little bit similar to this idea, right? The, the closeness that a dog has with their owner and the closeness that we have with God. 
And so reading again, John chapter 10, verse 11, it says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, there's this closeness that we need to get from this passage. Okay, it's very important for us. And here's something that I, I kind of want to talk about. I remember a lot of people, whenever they preach on this passage, uh, they, they talk about how dumb sheep are. Right. I, and I, I was doing some kind of research, some uh, commentary reading and stuff like that. And they talk about how if sheep eat all of the grass in an area, they'll just stay there and die, even if there's a field like a little bit further away. Or if they run out of grass, maybe they'll start eating the poop from their other fellow sheep or even their own. Um and it's just really this image of how dumb sheep are and then how much we are in need of a savior. Um, and I'm not saying that's that's wrong, right? I'm not disagreeing with that. But I, I do want to take it a little bit differently this morning to kind of emphasize some things for us and maybe go a little bit deeper, um, not just to give us head knowledge, not just to pat ourselves on the back or anything like that, but to get to know a little bit more about God's heart through this passage. Okay, So this is our... Uh, these are the points that I'll be talking about today. Jesus is the good shepherd that one knows his sheep and two gathers his sheep. Okay, so we're going to start off with Jesus is the good shepherd that knows his sheep. So I'm going to be focusing in on really just these two things this morning. So if you'll follow along with me as I read 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, I'm sure this isn't really a surprise to anyone that has been a Christian for any amount of time, that God knows us, right? Um, I think even people who aren't Christian might have some sort of a grasp of this idea that God knows everything. Uh, but I, I want to really take this a little bit deeper for us this morning and focus in on what it says here, right? Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. What sort of a relationship is this? Just as God the Father and Christ the Son know each other, Christ knows us in that way. Now, I'm sure many of you in the church have heard and seen um, talked about the Trinity, kind of debated it, heard about all the, the different metaphors that people come up with for this, this topic, this doctrine, and just how confusing it is. But really what it boils down to is there's three persons, but they're of one essence. So if we want to talk about how close God the Father and God the Son know each other, they're of one Right? They're, they're so close, they're so intertwined, so knit together that they're one. Now, this is exactly the same thing that I want to emphasize for you. Right? That God knows you that closely, that intimately, that deeply. And it's not this sort of you can hide from God sort of thing. Like, you can't. Like, we've, we've read the Bible, Adam and Eve trying to hide with fig leaves and just hiding in a garden that God made. We do the same thing. But I want to emphasize for us today that we don't have to hide. In fact, it's kind of futile. But the idea is here that God knows the depths of our heart. And that should change us. That should affect how we live. That should free us to live for him. I love the way Tim Keller puts it. To be loved but not known. Is comforting, but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficult life, difficulty life can throw at us. This is how much God knows. 
how much, how deeply God knows us, and yet he still loves us. Note my word choice there, yet he still loves us. Because let's be real here, we aren't that great. We're all sinners, we've all messed up, we've all done things to figuratively spit in the face of God. And God sees everything that we do, everything in our lives, and everything in our hearts, and he still comes to us and says, I love you. And this is where I want to actually stray a little bit. Um, because I think this is a great truth. If this is new to you, dwell on this. Meditate on this. Spend some time just sitting with the fact that God knows all of you and he still loves you. And I think oftentimes it ends there. Right? Sometimes when we listen to some sermons, that's just where it stops. God loves you. God knows all of you. Pat you on the head. Move on. But I want to take this a little bit further to say that it's not just about this pat on the head. And it's not just about feeling good. Through this passage, we, we see a little bit of God's heart. Later on in John 14, Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these he will do because I am going to the Father. And while I know this isn't exactly the point of why Jesus is sharing this with us, I think there's something important that we need to get from this, which is that God knows us. God chases after our hearts. God longs and desires to be with us. And that's exactly the same thing that we should be doing as well. Right? In 1 John chapter 4, it says this, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If God is chasing after our hearts in this way, where he's longing to just be close to us, just to know us a little bit deeper, just to show us this, this crazy love, we need to be the same way. Okay? Our hearts need to be as God's heart. I want to challenge all of us this morning to say, man, God is the good shepherd. And God knows you. God knows everything that you're going through. And that's not an excuse for you to not do the same thing. That's not an excuse for you to not seek after God or seek after others in the same way, to love others in the same way. I've shared about these people before. Um, this is my church staff at Crossway, the last church that I was serving at. And I think there's something to, that I just kind of want to say about them, which is that even two years now, I think it's been roughly two years, a year and a half, uh, since I've served here and left and gone to serve at the current church that I'm at, um, I still catch up with them. I still talk with them, and they're still great brothers and um, fellow co-laborers in Christ with me. And there's this sense of just connection that we have. And it's not like we're just Im like intensely close to each other in the sense that like, oh, life, everything that we do, everything that happens in our lives is like shared. Uh, no, it's like a lot of them are far fur further away now. A lot of them have moved to other churches as well. Um, one of them actually goes up to San went up to San Francisco. And we're just not at the same place anymore. But in the same way that God desires to care, desires to love, desires to know about us and everything that we're going through and just care for us in that way, man, we're able to care for each other. Right? Even with Sebastian, sometimes I'll talk with him and we'll catch up and see how things are going um, with Glenn and William and Chris. And I'm sorry if I'm missing any names right now. But like just being able to just catch up and say, hey, how have things been going? How, like anything that I can pray for you. And the intimacy that we can build there, even from across the state, even maybe across the world, 
Um, I have some friends that are missionaries in Japan right now, and being able to just send them a message and say, "Hey, how have things been? How are how are you doing?" Just being able to care and love on them in that way. And I think what I want to warn everyone of is this. This is something that I've actually heard from well-meaning people of uh, generally a specific sort of crowd, um, but. It's this idea, stop texting first and see how many dead plants you've been watering. Right, we'll see this as kind of a warning for people like, you know, you've put in all this effort into your relationships. If you stop texting them first, you'll see how many people actually care to text you first. And honestly, as I was reading through this passage, I think I felt really convicted, right, that of how wrong this is. Of how much this is just off from God's heart. Of how much this is almost in some ways fostering a heart of selfishness rather than the heart of God. Because what you see is stop texting first and see how many dead plants you've been watering. It's, it's telling you, hey, you keep reaching out to people. They don't reach out to you. You shouldn't care about them. You should just let them go. Let them live their lives. Let them do what they want to do. And I see nothing about that in the Bible. Right? Rather, I see this idea, and I love this passage, right? Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Like, for those that are competitive, I'm a little bit competitive, I'm going to be honest with you. Um... It's saying make it a competition to love each other better than the other, right? Hey, I got this time. Like, I'm paying. And not the, the sort of, like, fake Chinese, um, I'm gonna pay, like, fight for the paycheck sort of thing. But, like, actually going out of your way to check in on people, to love on them, to... Especially during this quarantine time, I've, I've noted, um, just kind of even looking at the people in my church nowadays, uh, that a lot of people just become recluses introverts uh, they'll, they'll live their own lives in their own homes in their own everything and not really go outside of their little bubble um and maybe they're not used to it maybe they don't know what to do but even in this time period there's so many people that are lonely there's so many people that are suffering um i had some conversations with some friends of mine actually the pastor of my old church and he was sharing how yeah, people have interacted with this this time of quarantine very differently. There's some people that have suffered a lot. Some people are thriving in this because they don't like people. <laughs> um, I've been doing okay, and I don't know. I I just I just want to say, like, even for us living in this time, man, we need to reach out to one another. We need to be there for one another, just as Christ shows His love for us. Right? Our calling as Christians isn't to build up walls, to care for our own, to just you know, make sure that we've got everything all together. No, it's to love one another as Christ loved us. It's to go out of our way to sacrifice for one another. To outdo one another in love. And all of this really ties back to God being the good shepherd. Christ being the good shepherd that knows his sheep. We are made to be image bearers of Christ and display his love to the people around us. It's only once we've started doing something so simple as this that we can even start to have a testimony to tell other people about him. The next point that I want to talk about is Jesus is the good shepherd that knows his sheep and that gathers his sheep. Uh, this one is a little bit different, and I want to kind of emphasize this point for us this morning. Let me read it for us. It comes from verse 16. It says this, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Now, I, I want to say I've heard this preached in a very specific way as well, especially as, you know, Asian, Gentile, like someone outside of the Jewish culture. 
this again just kind of becomes his head pet right it just kind of becomes this idea that you know there's other people out there they're not christian yet they're not christ followers yet so i'm gonna bring them in and for us as those very people that are outside of israel we can feel good about ourselves because we've been brought in we we found jesus and we're living our lives for jesus and good job like and I think oftentimes that's where it ends. But I want to say again that I don't want you to just read this and go, yes, I've made it. Like, I was counted worthy. Like, first off, Christ is worthy and we are just covered by Christ. But I want to take this and really say that this is about God sharing his heart with us. Right? This isn't just about us feeling good. I don't think Christ shared things just so that we could feel good about ourselves. But rather, I think God shared these things with us through the Bible so that we can know a little bit more about his heart for his people. Right? Um, it's this idea that when we look into the world, there's people that aren't believers. There's people that are still lost today. And I think a lot of the times people will talk missions. Um, yes. Missions. <laughs> Like, I don't want to take that away. Like, it, yes, go on missions. Go and share the gospel with cultures and countries and peoples around the world that haven't had even the chance to hear about God. But also, there's this sense of the people just around you. Your neighbors. Your neighbors across the street. Your coworkers. People that you just run into here and there. And it's like, we don't really know, but I think there is this sense of individualistic society that, that kind of presses on us to not want to know, not want to care about the people that we see. Um, I think going back to the idea of the quarantine, just, you know, just being all on our own and caring for ourselves. Who are some people that maybe God has put into your life that need you to be the one to tell them about God? And I think this is what I want to emphasize for us this morning. I think as we read this verse, um, we see this. We see that second sentence, right? I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. And I think oftentimes we just kind of read that and don't think about anything for us, right? We see that as Jesus saying, Jesus, I am going to bring them and they're going to listen to me. I'm going to do the work. And it's like, yes, yes, God is going to do the work. But, man, I, I guess if you want to, I, I, I'm a little wary about how I want to say this, but let's just put it this way. Jesus isn't here right now on this earth, physically present, right? He sent this Holy Spirit. Um, so who's going to do this then? Yes, the Holy Spirit does and can and will do this through just supernatural crazy means. Um, I really love all those stories. But at the same time, I want to say that there is this sense of responsibility that Christ is imparting onto us. That it's not just about us and him and just, oh yeah, if, as long as my spiritual life is good with him, as long as I go to church and do my devos every day and like spend some time in the word and pray and all that sort of things, like, I'm good with God. No, there's so much more than that. Even, even for the last point, sharing, like, if you actually love God, you'll do his commands. And I think there is the sense of Jesus sharing his heart, not for the sake of just so we can get to know him better, but so that we can actually take this and live it out in our lives, right? So that we can actually take this responsibility on ourselves and say, yes, Jesus, I want these people that don't know you to be a part of this flock to actually come to get to know you and be in a loving relationship with you. And for us to go out, take this responsibility, and then go out and do what God has called us to do. One of the things that I'm realizing about myself as I serve um, at my church, I'm horrible at delegating. <laughs> 
Um, and it's not like there's no nobody around that I can delegate things to. There's people that are here that I can uh, lean on and kind of share the burden with and share the responsibility with. And even, you know, just invite them into serving. Um, but I think a part of me, and I'll be honest with you, there is a sense of pride uh, where I, I'm like, I'm going to do it myself because I know how I want it. And I'm kind of particular, so as if I as as long as I can have it the way that I want it, and I'll just I'll just do it myself, and it'll be fine. I'll just suffer a little bit and sleep a little bit less. Um, but there's also this sense of pride where I'm not willing to ask somebody else. I'm a little bit worried, a little bit scared. I'm a little bit feeling like I'm going to put a burden on someone else. And I'm still honestly trying to wrap my head around this idea of how can I delegate well? How can I invite other people well into even serving, right? And even kind of thinking about my experience at South Bay Bible Church, that was the first time I served in church. And I remember Pastor Albert walked up to me, it was a Friday night, and he was just like, hey, do you want to help out with sound? And I was like, I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> and he he just kind of took me over and showed me how to do everything and i remember really kind of just doing it and maybe sometimes doing it too much and being kind of you know i don't know too hands-on where i would just stand there in front of the sound thing awkwardly uh <laughs> but i just remember that because of that i think that was really the first invitation that i got into serving and really just being able to take part in what the church was doing. Um, And really just how great of an opportunity that was for me to learn and to grow in that way. And I think for me, I need to learn really to not just hoard all these things to myself, but really allow other people to step into it. Um, And let's be real, in some ways, despite my pride and despite my own... I don't know, I guess thoughts that I can do everything myself. There is the sense that I am not able to do everything by myself and I need other people. Um, But God's not like that. In fact, if we're being clear and open, like, honestly, God probably doesn't need us to do anything. And I I hope you can kind of hear that not with the sense of, okay, I'm not going to do anything then. But I want to say that It's not just about the fact that God doesn't need us to do anything. It's about the fact that God is inviting us regardless to take part in what he's doing. And I think when we are able to really step into these places of this is what God wants, this is God's heart, I think we grow. We learn a little bit more about who God is and we learn about his heart. And then we grow as Christians, as people. I want to talk a little bit about this that I think will be kind of the block for us uh, regarding this topic. It's the bystander effect. We're less likely to help if others could. It's this, it's this idea where if, say, you're in a crowd, somebody gets hurt. In this image, this, this lady is on the floor and everyone's just around her. Now, here's the thing. The bystander effect says the more people there are, the less likely anyone's going to go and do anything. Because they're thinking, somewhere in the back of your head, maybe not consciously, but they're thinking, someone else is going to do it. I don't have to do anything. Like, you know, that person over there, that th- maybe there's a doctor somewhere. Maybe, maybe there's someone else more qualified. Maybe someone else can go and take this person and help them. And I, I, I'll just go about my day. And I remember reading some stories about where it just really went really wrong, where, man, somebody died because people took this so far. And I think for us as Christians, this is perhaps something that we suffer from, right? We're less likely to help if others could. And we think about, okay, there's a lot of Christians in the world. There's a lot of other people in the world. There's a lot of other more qualified people in the world, God can send them. Someone else that's better fit for this job can go. And 
I think one of the, the statements that always comes up for me when it comes to qualifications and and even thinking about my own qualifications as someone who honestly doesn't like public speaking. And God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies those he calls. Obviously, sometimes he'll call the qualified as well, but I hope you understand what I'm getting at here. It's that it's not about qualifications. It's not about, uh, it's not about any of those things. Really, it's this idea of we as Christians should be the first to stand and go and say, hey, this is the gospel. Hey, you need this help that I can offer you. Maybe not like that. Maybe a little bit more tactful. But you, you get the idea where, man, there's so many people in need of God. And yet, so often for us, we're content with just saying, someone else can do it. I think one of the biggest lies that I've heard being told in the Christian church is that it's okay to just live a good life. That is such a toxic lie. God didn't say, just live a good life, as if moralism and living a good life can somehow get us into heaven. That's not the point. The point is, God, everything that we do, all that we do, the worship that we do, the church, the devotions, the small groups, all of these things, it's about God. And God is calling us into something greater, something better, something a lot more than what we can even imagine. And so hopefully, I want you guys to see this, and I want you guys to be challenged by this, is that Man, don't settle for anything less. Put yourself into positions where you have to rely on God. Follow God's leading in your life. Don't just follow your own leading. Don't just follow, man, the leading of the world around you. I didn't talk about this, but in the, the past few verses before this passage, in John chapter 10, it talks about these other shepherds, these hired hands that don't actually pay attention to the sheep. They just leave. When danger comes. I think maybe a challenge for you today is to ask the question. Who are these hired hands that you've been following? Have you been following after God? The ways of God? Understanding God's heart? Or have you been living a life following in the footsteps of a hired hand? I think when we step into this idea of, man, I'm going to reach out first. I'm going to be, I'm going to take a risk. Because it's risky, it's scary, it's, it's terrifying. But I'm going to take that risk because God is worth it to say, hey, I want you to know about this, this God that I worship, God that I love. I want, I want you to know about this relationship that I have with the God of the universe and his desire to be in relationship with you. And it's only once we've taken that step that we can actually see God work. That we can actually see God moving in such wondrous ways. And we can actually see people coming to Christ. Coming to know him. In closing, I just want to kind of reiterate Jesus is the good shepherd that knows his sheep and that gathers his sheep. And the invitation that we have today is to follow in that. I love this quote. Uh, I was reading and kind of studying up. This is from a commentary. And it says this, In John, the theme is consistently Jesus' identity. Stories unveil who he is, but in each case... The problem is not necessarily intellectual. It's not about how much they know. It's not about how much they can understand something. The problem is often an unwillingness to respond to the challenge of the saying. So the issue that we have, the issue that 
Man, all of mankind has. Every Christian in the world has. Isn't an intellectual thing. I'm sure this passage, these verses, you've read them at least a dozen times in your life. Maybe if you're a newer Christian, at least two, three, four, five times. The problem isn't whether or not you know it. It's what are you going to do with it? Jesus is the good shepherd that knows his sheep. What are you going to do about that? Jesus is the good shepherd that gathers his sheep, that goes out and finds the people that aren't part of his flock and gathers them to him. What are you going to do about that? And it all kind of comes down to this question for us. How are you going to respond? And this is one of the things where, honestly, I would say, I don't want you to leave with a pat on the head thinking that man God knows me God loves me God's going to do all these great things in the world and God's going to bring all these people to know him I want you to be thinking man I want a part of this I want to see God doing such crazy things such crazy miracles such wondrous things in this world in this life I want to see God bring people to him. I want to take part in that. Because let me tell you, there is nothing that can bring joy like that. As seeing someone completely open to Christ. Say, God, I finally found you. God, I need you. So how are you going to respond? What are you going to do about it? Let me pray for us as we close. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this challenge. God, you are our shepherd. And yeah, we need you so desperately. There's nothing that we can do apart from you. God, we need you to speak into our hearts, speak into our lives. God, would you move within our hearts and our lives, God, that we can seek for more of you. God, help us to not just take your word and let it fall to the side. Help us to not just Take this as a puffing up of our intellect. God, help us to respond. Help us to think. Guide us, God. Lead us, teach us, help us, mold us. Push us, God, where we need to be pushed to do your will. To reach out to the people that you've placed in our lives, God, to encourage our brothers and sisters and to bring more and more sheep into the fold. God, we thank you for this challenge. We thank you for really your word. And we pray, God, that you would be a part of our hearts and our lives, that we would focus on you and you alone through all of it. Help us. It's your name we pray. Stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who 
who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Though I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know that we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Cause you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us. Oh, you're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. It's who I am. It's who I am.